Good evening, church. We are reading two passages today, and the first one is from Psalm 45. You can find that on page 569 on the church Bible. And, and the second one is from Revelation chapter 19, verse 4 to 9, which you can find on page 1247. Before I read, let us pray. Holy Father, we know that you look to the one who is humble and contrite and trembles at your word. And so we pray this evening, would you give us great humility as we listen to your word and preach. Give us soft, teachable hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 45 For the director of music to the tune of Lilis of the sons of Korah, a masculine, a wedding song. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You are the most excellent of men and your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In majesty, ride forth victoriously. In the cause of truth, humility, and justice, let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Your love, righteousness, and hate, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From palaces adorned with ivory, the music of the strings makes you glad. Daughters of kings are among your honored women. At your right hand is the royal bride in gold of Ophir. Listen, daughter, and pay careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. Let the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your lord. The city of Tyre will come with a gift. People of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. In embroidered garments she is led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her, those brought to be with her. Let in with joy and gladness they enter the palace of the king. Your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. Second passage is from Revelation 19, verse 4, which you can find on page 1247. Verse 4, the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. 
Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Thank you very much uh, for reading. Please do turn back to Psalm 45, uh, page 569. <clears throat> That's where we're going to be spending most of our time this evening. We all love weddings, don't we? Um, I don't know how many I've attended this year uh, here at Stag, quite a few. But I know when you get the, uh, you hear the couples engaged, you, you look forward with anticipation to that day, don't you? It's a day of great hope as a couple are united together. Uh, it's going to be a day of great joy. There might be lots of questions. What's, uh, what dress is the bride going to be in? What are the flowers going to be like? How is the church building decorated? And I guess even more so if it's a, a wedding on a bigger scale, maybe a national wedding. Back in 2011, um, William and Kate uh, got married. And I guess there was lots of national excitement about that day. A lot of joy, lots of bunting up, uh, street parties to celebrate. But in a bygone era, actually, a royal wedding would have had even more significance, wouldn't it? Actually, the future of the whole nation will be bound up in that event. What is the king of this nation like? Uh, What's this marriage going to be like? How will it work? Will there be children from it? What will their children be like? Because that's going to have big implications for the uh, nation in the future. Well, today, we're looking at Psalm 45. And we're going to see the glory of uh, the king and his wedding. And as we look at this this psalm, it's a one-off today to help us prepare for Christmas in a slightly different way. It's going to give us a bit of a different perspective on the Christmas story and on the Lord Jesus Christ. As over the next few weeks, we think about his birth, the birth of the king, He doesn't just stay that king in a manger, does he? We're going to see something of what he is like in his rule and his future, his wedding. And as we look at this psalm together, I hope that our hearts are going to be stirred up towards him, warmed afresh to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at every wedding I've ever been to, there are always speeches, aren't there? The uh, probably most uh, looked forward to speech is the best man speech. What are they going to say about uh, the groom? What is he like? What is his character like? Um, What dirt is there that might be dished up on him? Well, this psalm today is really, if you like, a best man's speech. The psalmist is uh, speaking to the king, uh, son of the great King David, uh, the bride listening in, and we get to listen in and overhear this best man's speech as well. And as the psalmist, the best man, if you like, begins, his heart is really thrilled and excited. Have a look at verse one. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. As he reflects on this speech he's about to give, his heart is so stirred up and excited, thrilled, because this is such a wonderful king and a glorious wedding that he is so privileged to speak about it and at it. Well, in the first half of this sermon, the first half of his speech, uh, he wants us to delight in the glorious king. Well, just like uh, most best man's speeches, this one is going to tell us what the king is really like, what the groom is really like. Who is this man? Get, help us to get to know him a little bit. Well, have a look at verse 2. You are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. Uh, The psalmist, the the best man, well, he starts by describing this groom's character. He is a king, and his character is most excellent. Actually, it is uh, more more excellent than any any other human. That is the idea behind it. 
His character is impeccable. There is no one like him. And to hear him speak, well, that is a wonder and a joy. His words are words of grace. They're full of life, vitality. Everybody would be agog to listen to what he has to say because his words are so wise and gracious. And so God blesses this king forever. God favors him. This is the kind of king God is pleased with. And given who this groom king is, well, the best man encourages him in his role. Have a look at verses uh, 3 to 5 with me. Gird your sword upon your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victorious in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. Let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. Well, at that time, kings really ruled. They're the ones with power. They were the government. And the best man here, the psalmist, is encouraging this king to be the king God wants him to be. To take up his sword, to ride out and fight for truth, for humility, for justice. In a world full of lies and corruption, in a world full of pride and injustice, this king is going to fight against those kinds of things. He is going to establish truth. He's going to establish humility and justice. That is what his kingdom will be like. And maybe as we reflect on the events uh, we've seen in the news over these past few years, in some ways maybe they've shown us more clearly how much the world needs a king like this, who will establish these characteristics and whose kingdom will be characterized by them. Actually, a king who cares for truth and not lies, who is humble and values humility, not pride, who values justice and not what he can get out of it. Well, this uh, best man continues to describe the king's rule. Have a look down at verse 6. Your throne, O God, will last forever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. This king's throne, his rule, is going to last forever and ever. A never-ending kingdom, a dynasty, just as God promised David in 2 Samuel 7. His his scepter, that kind of uh, stick to kind of show his authority to rule, is characterized by justice, always concerned for what is right, what is good, what is fair. There's no hint of corruption, no hint of exploitation or what this king can get out of it for himself, given his position. No, rather, verse 7, this king loves righteousness. It's what drives him. It's what drives his policies, not self-aggrandizement or position on the world stage or prosperity, but righteousness, what is good and right. That is what passionately drives him. And similarly, he passionately hates all wickedness, all evil, all wrong. What God is like, what God wants for a king, that is what this king is like. And so this king gives overwhelming joy. God gives this king overwhelming joy. And so as the king, uh, as the best man describes this king, well, it is a glorious character, isn't it? He truly is the most excellent of men. There is no dirt to dish at this best man's speech. Only wonderful goodness. Imagine with me how good it would be to have a king like this as your king, to be a member of his kingdom. It would be joyous, wouldn't it? And good. 
And as I read verse 8, enjoy the multi-sensory experience of this verse, how it appeals to our eyes and noses and ears. Verse 8, all your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From palaces adorned with ivory, the music of strings makes you glad. The wedding clothes are immaculate, spotless, beautiful, richly made. There's a wonderful scent as maybe the king um, processes past you of uh, myrrh and cassia. It's a little bit like cinnamon, apparently. The decadence of a uh, palace with, filled with good things, including things that are ivory, as a picture of just the sheer value here. The beautiful music. It is also good and glorious, isn't it? And having seen the splendor of this king and his character, well, the best man now shows us some other people in the wedding party. Have a look at verse 9. Daughters of kings are among your honored women. women. At your right hand is the royal bride in gold of Ophir. This king is internationally renowned for his splendor and goodness and greatness. Daughters of kings of the other nations come to his wedding. And his bride is there too, beautiful as well, dressed in the best precious gold of Ophir. What a king. What a wedding. As amazing and spectacular uh, that, as Will and Kate's wedding was. Well, it is nothing compared to this day, is it? And as the bride here listens in to this speech and, and hears what the best man says about her groom... Well, it should cause her heart to be stirred as well, shouldn't it? And thrilled with her groom as she is reminded of his splendor. Stir up her heart to love him. And as we overhear this speech as well, and as we see this king, our hearts should be stirred up towards him in affection, in wonder, delight, longing for a ruler like him. Imagine what a country, imagine what a world would be like if we had a king like this. But it does all lead to the question, doesn't it? Well, just who is this king? Uh, this psalm, the best man's speech, if you like, it was written for a king of Israel, a descendant of the great king, David. But if you know your Bible history as you read um, the book of Kings, well, very few of those kings were anything like King David. And even as great as King David was, he still doesn't quite fit this psalm in all its excellences. So is this psalm just sort of some wishful thinking, kind of the hope of a better kingdom, an idealistic king that we would love to have, but it's just sort of a, an empty hope? Is it just a, a, the empty hope of a make-believe wedding, a Disney princess fairy tale? No, it isn't. See, this best man's speech is ultimately for a wedding that is yet to come, the wedding where history is headed. The best man describes a king who was born that very first Christmas, Jesus Christ, who was born of the line of Joseph, a descendant of that great King David. And all the way through this psalm, as we've read it, if we felt the description is too good to be true, what king could be like this? Well, this king, the Lord Jesus Christ, is like this. He is the ultimate king, isn't it? Isn't he? The king. Jesus is the king who is the most excellent of men, most excellent king. Utterly unlike any other, perfect in all his ways, perfect in all of his character. Indeed, Jesus, in his ministry, after he finished talking on one occasion, uh, other crowds said, well, all the people spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words. That's exactly the phrase used of this psalm, isn't it? That came from his lips. In John chapter 7, verse 46, others said, no one ever spoke the way this man does. Maybe read a gospel yourself, one of the accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and hear Jesus' grace-filled words, his life-giving words for yourself. And we saw in verses 3 to 5 that the king, where well, he fights for truth, humility, and justice as he rides out, 
Now, do you have, remember how Jesus rode out on that, at the start of that final week of his life? On that first Palm Sunday, he rode out, not on a war horse in prow, with pride and power, but he rode out in humility on a donkey. He rode out to the cross to fight for justice and truth. Through his death on the cross, Jesus establishes his kingdom, a kingdom characterized by truth, humility, and righteousness. King Jesus is the king who will ensure perfect justice is done because he loves righteousness and hates wickedness. And grasping that this king is the Lord Jesus Christ, it makes sense of verse 6. I don't know whether you were slightly puzzled when you heard that read. Verse 6 says this, Your throne, O God, will last forever. Well, as you're reading through, your throne very naturally reads of the king, doesn't it? This king's throne will last forever. But then, O God, he is addressed as God. No Israelite king was ever called God. That would be blasphemy, wouldn't it? There is one God in heaven. The identity of this glorious king is God himself. God himself come to us as a man, Jesus Christ, at that first Christmas. As it says uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, it picks this up and confirms what we've been saying. But about the Son, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, and then he quotes Psalm 45, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. Who is this king? It is as we've been saying, isn't it? The Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And his throne is forever and ever. He is the forever king. He will never die. His kingdom will never be passed on to a successor with the questions of, What now? What will he be like? No, this king, glorious king, will rule forever and ever. And as this best man, this psalmist, shows us the splendor of our king, Jesus, our hearts too should be stirred with love, with joy, with wonder at such a great and wonderful and glorious king. Imagine how good it would be to be in his kingdom to be under his rule, for this king to be your king, our king. Indeed, if you are a Christian here this evening, this is your king, the king whose birth we will remember over these next few weeks. But all the way through, we've been saying that this is a royal wedding. We've been saying this is a best man speech. And therefore, if the king, the groom, is the Lord Jesus, well, who is the bride at this wedding. And that is where our second passage uh, helps us a little bit. If you just flick on to Revelation uh, 19, again, page 1248. Revelation uh, 19, page 1248. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. So who is this bride? Well, it is God's holy people, isn't it? God's holy people, his church, us. Those Jesus fought for at the cross to redeem, to make his own. And the second half of this psalm, the second half of this best man's speech, where it is addressed to the royal bride, to us, if you like. And so secondly, devote ourselves to our groom king. Have a look uh, back at Psalm 45, at verse 10. Listen, daughter, and play careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. Let the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honour him, for he is your Lord. 
Uh, at this point in the psalm, the best man, the, the psalmist wants the bride to listen up. Here's his advice for a good marriage. Forget your people, uh, where you grew up. Forget your father's house and be devoted to your husband, king. Don't keep looking back to the country you came from, to your birth family or um, the nation you came from, what they're like. But be devoted to your king. In our wedding service, if any of us have been to a wedding this year, we would have heard these words. The bride promises to the groom to forsake all others and to be faithful to him, her husband, as long as you both shall live. And that is exactly what the psalmist is telling uh, the bride here, isn't it? Forsake all others. Don't look back. Devote yourself to your groom, king. And as us, the church, as we've seen, we are the bride of Christ, the bride that is promised to him, pledged. And so similarly, we too must forsake all others and be faithful to him. Not looking back at who we once were, how we once lived, following the pattern of this world or our desires. Rather, we must be those who are devoted to him corporately as his people, who live our lives now together, worthily of our king in holiness. Indeed, this bride is to enthrall the king with her beauty, verse 11. I don't think that's physical beauty. I think that's her character, just as we've seen the character of the king throughout this psalm. And so with us, the church, what will enthrall Jesus as he looks at his bride, the church, as he looks at us. But he's seeing a church committed to him, committed to what he values, to truth, humility, justice, loving righteousness, hating wickedness, speech full of grace. And as we do that, as we grow into that, well, our groom king will delight and be overjoyed in us. And what a joy it will be for us, too, to devote ourselves to such a groom king, given the splendor we have seen. And the wedding itself will be glorious and full of joy. Have a look at verses 12 to 16. The city of Tyre will come with a gift. People of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. An embroidered garment she is led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her, those brought to be with her, led in with joy and gladness as they enter the palace of the king. And now we see the glory of uh, the bride, dressed in the most beautiful clothing. I've never seen a, a wedding dress that's been got gold threads in it, but this one does. It's richly embroidered. Her bridesmaids follow her. Abundant joy and gladness. And as we've seen, this is a picture of the wedding, the wedding in the future, the wedding where history is going to, that marriage of Christ and the church. And as we heard in Revelation 19, um, at that wedding, the church is clothed in fine linen, bright and clean, our righteous acts as a result of our devotion to Christ, who we've been promised to. This is the wedding that awaits us, his church. Do you see how wonderful this is? How glorious this groom king is. How good it is to be one of his people in his kingdom. But there's always a, there's a bit of a problem there, isn't there? You see, it is wonderful as it would be to be simply a subject under this king. That would be amazing, wouldn't it, as we thought already? But actually, as we think about it here, who knows King Charles or Prince William? Maybe a few of us have kind of met him, or maybe someone's even shaken his hand. But none of us know him. See, here is something far greater promise, not just a member of this king's kingdom, but a marriage between the church and Christ himself. We will be, we are his bride. We will, as his people, be married to this king. It is a glorious thought. And that means that forever and ever, 
we will know him, this king, closely, deeply, richly, wonderfully, corporately sharing the joy and delight of this wedding feast and relationship with him forever. And so forever and ever, this kingdom will last. For and ever and ever, this marriage will last. See, this is the Hollywood happily ever after wedding, isn't it? The true wedding that every Hollywood film looks ultimately for and wants, but never has. This is it. And as this best man's speech comes to an end, well, he wants to tell of the glories of this king and of this marriage. It's too good to keep to himself. That's why he's written the psalm. Have a look at verse 17 with me. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever. So enthralled is the psalmist, so enthralled is this best man by the character of the king and the glorious wedding that he wants to tell all other people through all generations. And I hope as we've looked at this psalm, we can understand why. And as he tells all peoples throughout the generations, well, the nations, the world will come and praise this king too. The wonder of the wedding banquet of the church and Christ in the future. And so this Christmas time, well, let's be joining in with this psalmist and telling others too of the glories of this king. Going beyond the birth of the king at Christmas, that is a great place to start, but beyond that, to the glorious futures of his rule and the future of this amazing marriage of Christ and his church. And the wonderful reality is that all peoples, indeed anyone, any one of us here can come to this wedding. It is a wedding with an open invite to become part of God's people, to have this king over us, to become part of his people and to be part of that wedding feast and to enjoy the eternal blessings of being part of this king's kingdom forever and to know its joys, and the joys of knowing this king for all eternity. What a king. What a wedding. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this psalm. Father, we thank you for showing us the Lord Jesus Christ more clearly for showing us what he is like as the wonderful king. And so please stir our hearts as we continue to rethink and reflect on this psalm, to love him and trust him, to delight in him. And please stir our hearts, given that amazing future we have as the bride of Christ. Help us to look forward to that wedding day of Christ and the church And so, Father, please, as we look forward to it in anticipation, help us to forsake uh, the things of this world that draw us and attract us and help us to devote ourselves to our groom king and live for him. For your glory's sake. Amen.